Hello and welcome to this week's Arab Digest podcast. I'm William Law, editor of the Digest. You know, Arab Digest is something of a rarity in Middle East analysis. Our daily newsletter has no sponsors, and we carry our podcasts without any advertising. It is our subscribers who support Arab Digest, and we intend to keep it that way. To find out how you can support a truly independent voice in the Middle East and North Africa, head to ArabDigest.org. When you go to the website, be sure to check out how you can receive a reader-supported daily newsletter for two months for free. You heard that right, two months for free. My guest today is John Hoffman, a research fellow at Washington's Cato Institute. I'm talking to him in what's turned out to be a momentous week, not just in D.C., but right around the globe. John, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me on, Bill. Uh, well, here we are. Um, big night for Donald Trump on Tuesday. Uh, before we get to the implications of his win for the Middle East, can I ask you a question that many people here in London are asking me? How did this happen? How did a convicted felon, a man who's repeatedly shown contempt for the Constitution, a misogynist, purveyor of hate language, and a compulsive liar, how did Donald Trump regain the White House? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's a good question to ask. Um, but I think there's a, a couple reasons here. First, I think, you know, the, the, the decision by the Democrats to prop up Biden until the very last minute, knowing fully well that he was not in the mental state to, to run for the presidency or any office for that matter, and at the very last minute subbing out Biden for for Kamala Harris with really no input from voters, no open primary. This was really, in my opinion, at, at the heart of this failure by the Democrats to to really gain ground here. That, in addition to Kamala not really articulating any counter argument to Trump, other than you know scolding him and and rightfully so for how bad he is and he is horrible. But we saw in 2016 that this isn't a winning strategy for for opponents of Trump. And also, the whole Harris campaign had a lot of oddities to it, like this strange and embrace of of neocons like Liz and Dick Cheney, thinking that would somehow, you know, win people over. But tying this in to the Middle East, I, I think we saw the outcomes that so many were warning about when discussing America's bear hug of, of Israel's war in Gaza. M Muslim and Arab Americans, especially in critical places like Michigan, did not turn out for Harris in the way she needed them to. And this is a direct result of her her own choices, her her refusal to break with Biden on this issue. Mm, yeah, that's interesting. Michigan went to Trump. Yeah, I, th I think, I don't know if they've called it just yet, but I think it's leaning Trump. So the point here is that a state that she needed to win, she lost because of the Middle East. And, and that's interesting because in many Americans' minds, the Middle East is, is, is a place that they don't think too much about. But clearly, it had impact, um, at least in Michigan. We, we don't know the final results of that. But as you say, it's leaning towards, towards Trump. In any event, he's won. Uh, so let us go then to the Middle East. And, and first up, uh, as Americans are going to the polls on Tuesday... Benjamin Netanyahu fired his defense minister, Yoav Gallant. Reading between the lines, what, what do you make of the timing of that? So I think the timing was, of course, deliberate. Uh, with Washington consumed internally, Netanyahu went ahead and made his move, knowing that Washington couldn't or wouldn't even be able to process it. All Washington did was say, <laughs> essentially, Gallant was nice to work with, and we're looking forward to working with the next guy, who's going to be uh, Foreign Minister Katz. But both Netanyahu and, and Gallant were committed to Israel's wars. There, there were certain divisions between them, uh, even before October 7th. You know, think back to early 2023, Netanyahu you know, fired uh, Gallant over clashes regarding Netanyahu's uh, attempted overhaul of the judiciary. He ultimately reversed that decision like two weeks later. 
But there are certain divisions that led to this tension between Gallant and Netanyahu, namely the conscription of ultra-Orthodox Jews, a deal to release the hostages. And Gallant often, you know, complained that Netanyahu was was blocking a deal. And Gallant's call for a state commission into the security failures surrounding October 7th. Gallant also warned about a lack of a post-war plan, said that total victory over Hamas is nonsense. So, you know, there was there was tensions here. Uh, but what I think will be really interesting to look at moving forward is this move sparked a lot of protests across the country, including outside Netanyahu's residence. So I think uh, moving forward, something to watch will be how Israelis respond, because last time, Massive protests over Gallant's firing actually led to Gallant being reinstated. So mm. we'll still have to see what happens here. Yeah, yeah. And of course, uh, sacking your defense minister in, in the middle of, of a war is uh, is quite an extraordinary thing to do. But as you say, Netanyahu, ever the opportunist, uh, saw that opportunity and has taken it. Um, the extremist ministers in his cabinet the ones he is ultimately beholden to to stay in power, that's Ben Gavir, the national security minister, and Smotrich, the finance minister. What does a Trump win mean for them and their messianic vision to reshape the map of the Middle East and to create a greater Israel? So I think, you know, Ben Gavir and the Smotriches in Israel, you know, are, of course, happy to see this outcome. They, they were hailing Trump's comeback. They've already praised his victory. Netanyahu has praised it as as uh, a big comeback for Trump. I think they see a much freer hand for themselves under Trump, who provided Israel's far right with a number of concessions when he was in office last time. But I think also, you know, this is the problem with Donald Trump is, is his erratic, you know, behavior. Trump's also been signaling to Netanyahu uh, and, you know, of course, by extension, his coalition, that he doesn't want this war to undermine his own presidency. There's been reports of him telling Netanyahu to wrap it up before he takes office. He, but this is also coupled with contradictory rhetoric saying, you know, oh, well, I would let him finish the job. Biden's holding him back. So th this is the inherent problem with with Donald Trump is we don't know to what extent he will actually provide these actors with a free hand. You know, it seems like if last time was any example, he will. But I think also what's critical here is who Trump surrounds himself with, who Trump's cabinet is, you know, what voices are he is, is he listening to and who sways him? Yeah. And, you know, the evangelicals uh, have a particular interest in Israel and Trump owes us well, quite a bit, you could say, to the evangelicals. And as you say, the people that are surrounding him, there are clearly people who are not just very conservative, but also evangelical. Uh, Absolutely. Could could they swing this thing? Could could this this vision, which after all, when you look at what uh, you know, I think it was Smotrich put out a map showing that the Greater Israel went all the way up to Damascus, absorbed chunks of Jordan. I mean, it's to say nothing of the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem. I mean, it's an extraordinarily powerful messianic concept that that these two guys want to um, you know use to change the the very map of the middle east yeah i think this is the 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 looming question in everyone's mind you know trump even immediately after winning presented himself as the quote unquote peace candidate saying i'm not going to start any wars i'm going to end wars so we're already seeing a contradiction between what is happening on the ground in the Middle East, what Trump has supported previously and the rhetoric that he's assuming now, just, you know, hours after after winning. So it's I think it's too early to tell, you know, where exactly Trump will fall on this. I think also the situation on the ground in the Middle East is going to change dramatically, most likely between now and January 20th when he actually takes office. So we could be dealing with a completely different scenario. We could be dealing with a direct war between Israel and Iran. We could be dealing with a further just annihilation of, of Gaza or, or, or greater carving out of the West Bank. You know, so I think we'll have to resume this conversation, you know, come late January when we see what it, what it is exactly Trump is facing when he takes office.
You're listening to the Herb Digest podcast with me, William Law, and the Cato Institute's John Hoffman. Herb Digest is a truly independent voice on the Middle East and North Africa. No advertising, no sponsors. In the information overload world in which we all find ourselves, Herb Digest keeps it simple. One insightful article a day and the weekly podcast from top experts, analysts, writers, and commentators. Here at Arab Digest, we have put together a team of contributors you'll not find anywhere else. Check us out on ArabDigest.org. When you go to the website, be sure and look out for the offer of a free two-month trial to our reader-supported daily newsletter. John, you've made a, a really good point about the erratic nature of Trump's foreign policy approaches. Bearing that in mind, let's move on to Tehran. Just last week, the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei was promising a crushing response to Israel and America. Do you see that happening now, or is there another scenario, which you touched on a little bit, Israel, with Trump's backing, hits the nuclear facilities, hits the oil uh, infrastructure, hits big military targets, all those things that Biden told Netanyahu you can't do. Will the Israelis, in a bid to bring down the Ayatollah's regime, you know, go in big against Iran. And then are we looking at a major war, Israel uh, against Iran? Quite possibly. And this is the uncertainty part that we were just talking about. Is and, and this is where I think we're in a very dangerous period between now and when Trump assumes office, because for all intents and purposes, the United States right now is leaderless. You know, Biden is asleep at the wheel. And, you know, Harris it clearly is not assuming office. So between now and January 20th, things could escalate dramatically in the Middle East, and we could be faced with a much different situation when Trump assumes office. It could already be a war between Israel and Iran by that time. But when when Trump was in office previously, he assumed a very hawkish stance towards Iran. He withdrew from the 2015 JCPOA nuclear accords, he reimposed sanctions, you know, started this maximum pressure campaign, which clearly failed. Uh, he assassinated the head of the IRGC, Qasem Soleimani, and he reportedly even tried to start war with Iran himself in, in his final days of office. But again, there's contradictory rhetoric here. Trump has, uh, you know, signaled in the past couple of weeks that he's the, the peace candidate, wants to bring peace to the Middle East. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's kind of laughable. But uh, Trump's uh, vice president, J.D. Vance, stated a few weeks ago that the United States doesn't have an interest in going to war with Iran. Trump said, you know, I'm going to stop wars, not start them. So who really knows? But he's also been accusing Biden this whole time over the past year that Hamas wouldn't have launched its attack. Hamas wouldn't have been able to because he was so tough on Iran, who's a, who's a supporter of Hamas. Uh, so again, it with Trump, it's difficult because he is so erratic, so all over the place. And I think it goes back to that question of who is he surrounding himself with? Is it the Mike Pompeo's of the world? Because they will certainly take a, a very hawkish stance on Iran. Mm. Do you think Pompeo will come back? Is that is that what the uh, the scuttlebutt is in Washington? Quite possibly, because he was campaigning for him just the other day, and you know, I, I think Pompeo, you know, and we'll have to see, you know, who else is influencing Trump's ear on U.S. Middle East policy. Mm, okay, Let, let's head off to the Gulf now, and uh, well, particularly Saudi Arabia and the UAE, the two big regional power players. How do you think they're responding to Trump? 2.0. So I think uh, they're quite thrilled to see Trump back in the White House. Uh, when Trump was in office, he cast his the full weight of the United States behind these actors. You know, Trump's first trip abroad was to Saudi Arabia. Remember his fun little little sword dance? He declared a, a national emergency when in office to, to push through billions of weapon sales to Saudi Arabia and the UAE. He approved the transfer of sensitive nuclear technology to Saudi Arabia shortly after the murder of, of Jamal Khashoggi, which also happened uh, during his administration. And it was Trump who brokered the the Abraham Accords and, and offered the UAE the F-35s in return. And it was also during the Trump administration that this 
push for Saudi Israel normalization also began. And now that this has assumed such a central position in U.S. Middle East policy, it, it should be assumed that Trump will pick right up where, where Biden left off in trying to broker this mega deal. They'll likely view this as a chance to further their their regional ambitions, knowing Trump will support them. I think th there was a really great piece by Dr. Talal Muhammad in, in Foreign Policy just a week or two ago titled The Gulf States Are Likely uh, Backing Trump, which really gives a great overview of this. And I would, I would suggest this to, to your listeners th that kind of dives into why Mohammed bin Salman and Mohammed bin Zayed are pretty thrilled, probably, <laughs> that uh, Trump is back in office. Yeah, that's interesting, you know, because I, I'm thinking about that uh, attack on the Saudi Aramco facilities when uh, certainly uh, Mohammed bin Salman and, and Mohammed bin Zayed, because, of course, the Emiratis were hit by, by Houthi missiles, that the expectation was, you know, Trump's going to back us. And when they turned around, Trump wasn't there. He didn't support them at that point. Yeah, and this is, again, the the erratic behavior of Donald Trump, because what we saw was in certain elements, an incredibly hawkish foreign policy, coupled with this discourse of America first and stuff like that. But getting involved in such wars are, are certainly not America first. So again, I think when it comes to Donald Trump, the, the problem is this erratic behavior and how easily he's swayed by others on certain issues. Should we assume, John, that the Trump win is extremely bad news to the Palestinians, or should we perhaps take another scenario? Trump's transactional approach to international diplomacy, could it be the last and only hope for a path that could lead to the much maligned two-state solution? Is there some ground for a sliver of optimism that Trump might be the, the one to sort this out? So I, I definitely don't think Trump is going to be good for Palestinians, but neither was was Biden or, or Harris. With Harris, there was a lot of speculation as to whether she would break with Biden once in office. This is, you know, despite her on the campaign repeatedly saying that she was not going to. But with Trump, we have a track record, his first four years in office of his approach to the Palestinians. And he really threw the Palestinians under the bus at every term. Uh, he was emphatically pro-Israel. It was under Trump that the U.S. ended uh, aid to the U.N. Agency for Palestinian Refugees, proclaimed that the U.S. no longer considered uh, Israeli settlements in the West Bank as a violation of international law. He formally recognized Jerusalem as, as Israel's capital and moved the embassy there. Remember, he revealed his so-called deal of the century, which essentially carved the Palestinian territories into a series of Bantustans. And he sidelined the Palestinians completely during the Abraham Accords. And more recently, while campaigning, you know, he's been using Palestinian as a slur for political opponents. And he's talked about, you know, letting Israel, quote unquote, finish the job in Gaza. So I don't think Trump is going to be good for Palestinians by by any uh, sense of the word. Whether this, you know, Trump can get us towards a two state solution or something like that. I'm more inclined to think that any, quote unquote, Palestinian state or or pathway towards a Palestinian state that would come of an agreement uh, uh, through, you know, like a Saudi Israel normalization and some mega deal is likely to be, you know, a little more than a repackaging of just the status quo. Yeah, well, that's the thing, too, is that this normalization, which, of course, Biden picked up on and was really pushing uh, between the Saudis yeah. and the Israelis. Uh, you know, is it more likely to happen now with Trump back at the White House? I think uh, uh, Trump will certainly pick up this project and, and push for it emphatically. Whether or not it will happen, uh, the way the plan is currently being laid out is with in return for normalizing relations with Israel, Saudi Arabia will be granted a formal security guarantee and cooperation with their civilian nuclear program. Trump has already, when in office last time, transferred sensitive nuclear technology to Saudi Arabia. So the the nukes part he's probably fine with the formal security guarantee whether he you know bites on that or not that needs two-thirds senate ratification the senate has flipped towards the republicans but again 
it will probably be difficult for Donald Trump to get the necessary Democratic votes for that to go through. And then, of course, you'll have some Republicans like Rand Paul and others who would oppose something like this. So I certainly see Trump picking up where Biden left off with the Saudi normalization stuff. Whether he's able to achieve it is a different question. Yeah, because, of course, if uh, Trump was to give the Saudis this uh, guarantee this, of, of military support, that you know could potentially drag America into a war that Americans clearly said over and over again, they don't want any more wars involving them in the Middle East. So that's um, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Yeah, no, I think it, uh, either the last podcast or maybe two ago that you and I did, I referred to this mega deal as a, a catastrophic miscalculation by the United States for that exact reason that you just pointed out. It would turn the United States into essentially the personal guard of Mohammed bin Salman. It would provide him with the cover to pursue even you know more reckless policies abroad. And it seriously risks the United States getting dragged into a broader conflict in the Middle East, which Trump's own narrative of America first, this blatantly contradicts. So again, this is the contradictions and erratic behavior of Donald Trump. Do you put any store by Mohammed bin Salman saying no deal, no normalization with Israel until uh, a clear pathway to the two-state solution is granted by the Israelis. Do you put any store in that? So, th so that's a, a, a tough question because we've seen behind the scenes the rhetoric of Mohammed bin Salman saying, you know, the Palestinians need to shut up and take what they're given. There was a really good article in The Atlantic that came out a month or two ago talking about the, kind of the inside dealings of the Biden administration since October 7th. And it quotes Mohammed bin Salman as saying, you know, like, I need quiet in Gaza. I don't really care about the Palestinians, but my people do. So, you know, I want to go ahead and move forward with this normalization. I think any pathway that's included as part of such a mega deal will likely be a pathway to nowhere. And that's because none of the actors involved, you know, Netanyahu, Trump now, care about creation of a Palestinian state, and Netanyahu's emphatically against it. But, you know, whether Mohammed bin Salman sticks to this, you know, we're not going to do it until there's actual concrete steps, or whether he'll, you know, gladly throw them under the bus, you know, the, the minute it looks like he can actually get his security guarantee, I think that remains to be seen. Mm. Okay, John, one, uh, one final question. Trump, I'm going to suggest to you one with a simple question. Are you better off now than you were four years ago? So let me end our conversation by posing another version of that question to you. Will the Middle East be better off four years from now, John? Unfortunately, I think the answer will be no. And my answer wouldn't have changed whether it was Trump elected or or Harris elected. Both Both candidates have shown that they favor the broad strokes of U.S. Middle East policy that has repeatedly produced one failure after another. The, the root causes of conflict and unrest across the region continue to worsen. Israel's wars have no end in sight. There's a prospect of a war on an even broader regional scale. There's been an authoritarian resurgence across the region. Economically, so much of the region is in shambles. I can't predict where the region will be in four years, but if I had to bet, I would say it's not going to be in a better place. And that is irrespective of, of Trump, Harris, or, or anybody who occupies the White House, because the United States fundamentally refuses to alter course. Mm, yeah. And as you say, be it uh, Biden or, or Trump before him or now Trump again, the impulse, the inclination is to support these authoritarian regimes and to deny the aspirations of many people in the region towards a more open and a freer sort of uh, governance. Precisely. Okay, well, I won't wait to, for four years from now to get back to you on this one, John. We'll have you back in the new year. No, great. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as you say, uh, let's see what, what happens when Trump, you know, plunks his, um, his butt <laughs> back into the White House whether he carries out some of his threats, uh, well, we'll have to wait and see. But um, in the meantime, 
I guess uh, you there in Washington are kind of waiting and watching. Well, what is the mood in Washington, by the way, since you're sitting there? I, you know, I haven't gone into the office today, frankly. So I, I, I haven't gotten a chance to read the room exactly, but I think there's a lot of anger towards the DNC, a lot of anger towards Biden and Harris and how this campaign was run and the inability to beat somebody that, as you correctly pointed out at the beginning of this uh, podcast, is a convicted felon, a man who has shown contempt for the Constitution, a misogynist, you know. Uh, so I think hopefully this leads to a lot of inward soul searching. But I, again, have have my doubts. OK, well, we'll leave it there. John, thanks again. Always a treat to, to talk with you. Thanks for having me, Bill. My guest today on the Arab Digest podcast was the Cato Institute's John Hoffman. You'll have noticed that we bring you the podcast with no advertising and no sponsors. We are a truly independent source for analysis and commentary on the Middle East North Africa. If you'd like to support our independent voice, head to our website at arabdigest.org where you can find out about our reader-supported daily newsletter and how to get a free two-month trial. The newsletter features the very best of Middle East and North Africa analysts, commentators, and writers, contributors like John. Check us out on ArabDigest.org. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And search our library of more than 250 podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Amazon, or other platforms. Our podcast guests provide unique insights insights you're not going to find anywhere else. That's a big reason why a quarter of a million people have listened to our podcasts right around the globe since we started in 2020. We thank you for listening. I'm William Law, editor of the Arab Digest, essential reading, essential listening from independent sources. Music